Section two of the Art of Fiction. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shirley from Allium. The Art of Fiction by Walter Besant and Henry James. Section two. Walter Besant's Lecture, Part two. The next simple rule is that the drawing of each figure must be clear in outline, and even only sketched, must be sketched without hesitation. This can only be done when the writer himself sees his figures clearly. Characters in fiction do not, it must be understood, spring minerva like from the brain. They grow. They grow sometimes slowly, sometimes quickly. From the first moment of conception, that is to say, from the first moment of their being seen and caught, they grow continuously and almost without mental effort. If they do not grow and become every day clearer, they had better be put aside at once and forgotten as soon as may be, because that is a proof that the author does not understand the character he has himself endeavoured to create. To have on one's hand a half-created being, without the power of finishing him, must be a truly dreadful thing. The only way out of it is to kill and bury him at once. I have always thought, for instance, that the figure of Daniel Deronda, whose portrait, blurred and uncertain as it is, has been drawn with the most amazing care, and with endless touches and retouches, must have become at last to George Eliot a kind of awful veiled spectre, always in her brain, always seeming about to reveal his true features, and his mind, but never doing it, so that to the end she never clearly perceived what manner of man he was, nor what his real character. Of course, what the author cannot set down, the reader cannot understand. On the other hand, how possible, how capable of development, how real becomes a true figure, truly understood by the Creator, and truly depicted. Do we not know what they would say and think under all conceivable conditions? We can dress them as we will. We can place them in any circumstances of life. We can always trust them, because they will never fail us, never disappoint us, never change, because we understand them so thoroughly. So well do we know them, that they become our advisers, our guides, and our best friends, on whom we model ourselves, our thoughts, and our actions. The writer, who has succeeded in drawing to the life, true, clear, distinct, so that all may understand, a single figure of a true man or woman, has added another exemplar or warning to humanity. Nothing, then, it must be insisted upon, as of the greatest importance, should be begun in writing until the characters are so clear and distinct in the brain, so well known, that they will act their parts, bend their dialogue, and suit their action to whatever situations that they may find themselves in, if only if they are becoming to them. Of course, clear outline drawing is best when it is accomplished, in the fewest strokes, and the greater part of the figures in fiction, wherein it differs from painting, in which everything should be finished, require no more work upon them in order to make them clear than half a dozen bold, intelligible lines. As for the methods of conveying a clear understanding of a character, they are many. The first and the easiest is to make it clear by reason of some mannerism or personal peculiarity, some trick of speech or of carriage. This is the worst, as may generally be said, of the easiest way. Another easy method is to describe your character at length. This also is a bad, because a tedious method. If, however, you read a page or two of any good writer, you will discover that he first makes a character intelligible by a few words, and then allows him to reveal himself in action and dialogue. On the other hand, nothing is more inartistic than to be constantly calling attention in a dialogue to a gesture or a look to laughter or to tears. 
The situation generally requires no such explanation. In some well-known scenes which I could quote, there is not a single word to emphasize or explain the attitude, manner, and look of the speakers, yet they are as intelligible as if they were written down and described. That is the highest art which carries the reader along, and makes him see, without being told, the changing expressions, the gestures of the speakers, and hear the varying tones of their voices. It is as if one should close one's eyes at the theatre, and yet continue to see the actors on the stage, as well as hear their voices. The only writer who can do this is he who makes his characters intelligible from the very outset, causes them first to stand before the reader in clear outline, and then with every additional line brings out the figure, fills up the face, and makes his creatures grow from the simple outline more and more to the perfect and rounded figure. Clearness of drawing, which includes clearness of vision, also assists in producing directness of purpose. As soon as the actors in the story become real in the mind of the narrator, and not before, the story itself becomes real to him. More than this, he becomes straightway vehemently impelled to tell it, and he is moved to tell it in the best and most direct way, the most dramatic way, the most truthful way possible to him. It is in fact only when the writer believes his own story, and knows it to be every word true, and feels that he has somehow learned from everyone concerned the secret history of his own part in it, that he can really begin to write it. Author's note, hardly anything, is more important than this to believe in your own story. Wherefore let the student remember that unless the characters exist and move about in his brain, all separate, distinct, living and perpetually engaged in the action of the story, sometimes at one part of it, sometimes at another, and that in scenes and places, which must be omitted in the writing, he has got no story to tell, and had better give it up. I do not think it is generally understood that there are thousands of scenes which belong to the story and never get outside the writer's brain at all. Some of these may be very beautiful and touching, but there is not room for all, and the writer has to select. And of author's note. We know how sometimes, even from a practised hand, there comes a work marred with a fatal defect that the writer does not believe in his own story. When this is the case, one may generally find on investigation that one cause at least of the failure is that the characters, or some of them, are blurred and uncertain. Again, the modern English novel, whatever form it takes, almost always starts with a conscious moral purpose. When it does not, so much are we accustomed to expect it, that one feels as if there has been a debasement of the art. It is fortunately not possible in this country for any man to defile and defame humanity and still be called an artist. The development of modern sympathy, the growing reverence for the individual, the ever-widening love of things beautiful, and the appreciation of lives made beautiful by devotion and self-denial, the sense of personal responsibility among the English-speaking races, the deep-seated religion of our people, even in a time of doubt, are all forces which act strongly upon the artist, as well as upon his readers, and lend to his work, whether he will or not, a moral purpose so clearly marked, that it has become practically a law of English fiction. We must acknowledge that this is a truly admirable thing, and a great cause for congratulation. At the same time, one may be permitted to think that the preaching novel is the least desirable of any, and to be unfaintly rejoiced that the old religious novel, written in the interest of high church, or low church, or any other church, has gone out of fashion. Next, just as in painting and sculpture, not only are fidelity, truth, and harmony to be observed in fiction, but also beauty of workmanship. 
it is almost impossible to estimate too highly the value of careful workmanship, that is, of style. Everyone, without exception, of the great masters in fiction has recognized this truth. You will hardly find a single page in any of them which is not carefully and even elaborately worked up. I think there is no point on which critics of novels should place greater importance than this, because it is one which young novelists are so very liable to ignore. There ought not to be in a novel, any more than in a poem, a single sentence, carelessly worded, a single phrase which has not been considered. Consider, if you please, any one of the great scenes in fiction, how much of the effect is due to the style, the balanced sentences, the very words used by the narrator. This, however, is only one more point of similarity between fiction and the sister arts. There is, I know, the danger of attaching too much attention to style at the expense of situation, and so falling a prey to priggishness, fashions, and mannerisms of the day. It is certainly a danger. At the same time, it sometimes seems, when one reads the slipshod careless English which is often thought good enough for story-telling, that it is almost impossible to overrate the value of style. There is comfort in the thought that no reputation worth having can be made without attending to style, and that there is no style, however rugged, which cannot be made beautiful by attention and pains. How many times a writer once asked a girl who brought him her first effort for advice and criticisms, how many times have you rewritten this page? She confessed that she had written it once for all, had never read it afterwards, and had not the least idea that there was such a thing as style. Is it not presumptuous in the highest degree to believe that what one has produced without pains, thought or trouble, will give any pleasure to the reader? In fact, Every scene, however unimportant, should be completely and carefully finished. There should be no unfinished places, no sign anywhere of weariness or haste, in fact no scamping. The writer must so love his work as to dwell tenderly on every page, and be literally unable to send forth a single page of it without the finishing touches. We all of us remember that kind of novel, in which every scene has the appearance of being hurried and scamped. To sum up these preliminary and general laws, the art of fiction requires, first of all, the power of description, truth and fidelity, observation, selection, clearness of conception and of outline, dramatic grouping, directness of purpose, a profound belief on the part of the storyteller in the reality of his story, and beauty of workmanship. It is, moreover, an art which requires of those who follow it seriously that they must be unceasingly occupied in studying the ways of mankind, the social laws, the religions, philosophies, tendencies, thoughts, prejudices, superstitions of men and women. They must consider as many of the forces which act upon classes and upon individuals as they can discover. They should be always trying to put themselves into the place of another. They must be as inquisitive and as watchful as a detective, as suspicious as a criminal lawyer, as eager for knowledge as a physicist, and was all fully possessed of that spirit to which nothing appears mean, nothing contemptible, nothing unworthy of study, which belongs to human nature. I repeat, that I submit some of these laws as perhaps self-evident. If that is so, many novels which are daily submitted to the reviewer are written in wilful neglect and disobedience of them. But they are not really self-evident. Those who aspire to be artists in fiction almost invariably begin without any understanding at all of these laws. Hence the lamentable early failures, the waste of good material and the low level of art with which both the novel writer and the novel reader 
are too often contented. I am certain that if these laws were better known and more generally studied, a very large proportion of the bad works of which our critics complain would not be produced at all. And I am in great hopes that one effect of the establishment of the newly founded Society of Authors will be to keep young writers of fiction from rushing too hastily into print, to help them to the right understanding of their art and its principles, and to guide them into true practice of their principles while they are still young, their imagination strong, and their personal experiences as yet not wasted in foolish failures. After all these preliminary studies, there comes the most important point of all, the story. There is a school which pretends that there is no need for a story. All the stories, they say, have been told already. There is no more room for invention. Nobody wants any longer to listen to a story. One hears this kind of talk. It's the same wonder which one feels when a new monstrous fashion changes the beautiful figure of woman into something grotesque and unnatural. Men say these things gravely to each other, especially man who has no story to tell. Other men listen gravely, in the same way, women put on the newest and most preposterous fashions gravely, and look upon each other without either laughing or hiding their faces for shame. It is indeed, if you think of it, a most strange and wonderful theory that we should continue to care for fiction and cease to care for the story. We have all along been training ourselves how to tell the story, and here is this new school which steps in, like the needy knife grinder, to explain that there is no story left at all to tell. Why, the story is everything. I cannot conceive of a world going on at all without stories, and those strong ones with incident in them, and merriment, and paces, laughter and tears, and the excitement of wondering what will happen next. Fortunately, these new theorists contradict themselves, because they find it impossible to write a novel which shall not contain a story, although it may be but a puny bantling. Fiction without adventure, a drama without a plot, a novel without surprises, the thing is as impossible as life without uncertainty. Author's note. A correspondent asks me if I do not like the work of Mr. Howells. Of course one cannot choose but like his writing. But one cannot also avoid comparing his work with that of his countryman, Nathaniel Hawthorne, who added to the charm of style the interest of a romantic and exciting story. End of author's note. As for the stories, then, and here theory and teaching can go no farther. For every art there is a corresponding science which may be taught. We have been speaking of the corresponding science. But the art itself can neither be taught nor communicated. If the thing is in a man, he will bring it out somehow, well or badly, quickly or slowly. If it is not, he can never learn it. Here, then, let us suppose that we have to do with the man to whom the invention of stories is part of his nature. We will also suppose that he has mastered the laws of his art and is now anxious to apply them. To such a man one can only recommend that he should with the greatest care and attention analyse and examine the construction of certain works which are acknowledged to be the first rank in fiction. Among them not to speak of Scott, he might pay a special attention from the constructive point of view to the truly admirable shorter stories of Charles Reed, to George Eliot's Silas Marner, the most perfect of English novels, Hawthorne's Scarlet Letter, Holmes' Elsie Venner, Blackmore's Lorna Doan, or Black's Daughter of Heth. He must not sit down to read them, for the story, as uncritical people say. He must read them slowly and carefully, perhaps backwards, so as to discover for himself how the author built up the novel, and from what original germ or conception it sprang. Let me take another novel by another writer to illustrate my meaning. It is James Payne's Confidential Agent, a work showing, if I may be permitted to say so, 
constructive power of the very highest order. You have all, without doubt, read that story. As you know, it turns upon a diamond robbery. To the unpractised hand it would seem as if stories of theft had already been told ad nauseum. The man of experience knows better. He knows that in his hand every story becomes new, because he can place it upon his stage with new incidents, new conditions, and new actors. Accordingly, Payne connects his diamonds with three or four quite ordinary families. He does not search for strange and eccentric characters, but uses the folk he sees around him, plain middle-class people to whom most of us belong. He does not try to show these people cleverer, better cultured, or in any respect at all other than they really are, except that some of them talk a little better than in real life they would be likely to do. That is to say, in dialogue he exercises the art of selection. Presently, in this quiet household of age and youth, love and happiness, there happens a dreadful thing. The young husband vanishes amid circumstances which give rise to the most horrible suspicions. How this event acts upon the minds of the household and their friends, how the faith, sorely tried, of one breaks down, and that of another remains steadfast, how the truth is gradually disclosed, and the innocence of the suspected man is made clear, all this should be carefully examined by the student as a lesson in construction and machinery. He will not, one hopes, neglect the other lesson taught him by this novel, which is the art of telling the story, selecting the actors, and skilfully using the plain and simple materials which lie around us everywhere ready to our hands. I am quite sure that the chief lesson to be learned from the study of nearly all our own modern novelists is that adventure, pathos, amusement, and interest are far better sought among lives which seem dull and among people who seem at first beyond the reach of romance than from eccentricity and peculiarity of manner, or from violent and extreme reverses and accidents of fortune. This is, indeed, only another aspect of the increased value which we have learned to attach to individual life. One thing more the art student has to learn. Let him not only believe his own story before he begins to tell it, but let him remember that in story-telling, as in almsgiving, a cheerful countenance works wonders, and a hearty manner greatly helps the teller and pleases the listener. One would not have the novelist make continual efforts at being comic, but let him not tell his story with eyes full of sadness, a face of woe, and a shaking voice. His story may be tragic, but continued gloom is a mistake in art, even for a tragedy. If his story is a comedy, all the more reason to tell it cheerfully and rightly. Lastly, let him tell it without apparent effort, without trying to show his cleverness, his wit, his powers of epigram, and his learning. Yet let him pour without stint or measure into his work all that he knows, all that he has seen, all that he has observed, and all that he has remembered, all that there is of nobility, sympathy, and enthusiasm in himself. Let him spare nothing, but lavish all that he has in the full confidence that the wells will not be dried up, and that the springs of fancy and imagination will flow again, even though he seem to have exhausted himself in this one effort. Here, therefore, we may leave the student of this art. Author's note. See Appendix. End of Author's Note. It remains for him to show whether he does wisely in following it farther. Of one thing for his encouragement he may rest assured. In the art of fiction, more than in any other, it is easy to gain recognition, far easier than in any of the sister arts. In the English school of painting, for example, there are already so many good men in the field that it is most difficult to win an acknowledged position. In the drama it is next to impossible to get a play produced, in spite of our thirty London theatres. In poetry it seems almost hopeless to get a hearing, even if one has reached the second rank. But in fiction the whole of the English-speaking race are always eager to welcome a newcomer. 
good work is instantly recognized, and the only danger is that a universal cry for more may lead to hasty and immature production. I do not mean that ready recognition will immediately bring with it a great pecuniary success. Unfortunately, there has grown up of late a bad fashion of measuring success too much by the money it seems to command. It is not always, remember, the voice of the people which elects the best man, and though in most cases it follows that a successful novelist commands a larger sale of his works, it may happen that the art of a great writer is of such a kind that it may never become widely popular. There have been among us two or three such writers. One case will immediately occur to most of us here. It is of that of a man whose books are filled with wisdom, experience, and epigram, whose characters are most admirably studied from the life, whose plots are ingenious, situations fresh, and dialogues extraordinarily clever. Yet he has never been widely popular, and, I am sure, never will be. One may be pretty certain that this writer's money value in the market is considerably less than that of many other whose genius is not half so great, but his popularity twice as large. So that a failure to hit the popular taste does not always imply failure in art. How, then, is one to know, when people do not ask for his work, if he has really failed or not? I think he must know without being told, if he has failed to please. If a man sings a song, he can tell in a moment, even before he has finished, if he has pleased his audience. So, if a man writes a novel, he can tell by the criticisms in the journals, by reading between the lines of what his friends tell him, by the expression of their eyes, by his own inner consciousness, if he has succeeded or failed. And if the latter, let him find out, as quickly as may be, through what causes— the unlucky dramatist can complain that his piece was badly mounted and badly acted. The novelist cannot, because he is sure not to be badly read. Therefore, if a novelist fail at first, let him well be assured that it is his own fault, and if on his second attempt he cannot amend, let him for the future be silent. One is more and more astonished at seeing the repeated efforts of writers whose friends should make them understand that they have not the least chance of success unless they unlearn all that they have learned, and begin again upon entirely different methods and some knowledge of the science. It must be a cruel blow, after all the work, that goes to make even a bad novel, after all the trouble of getting it published, to see it drop unnoticed, still-born, though hardly worthy to receive words of contempt. If the disappointment leads to examination and self-amendment, it may prove the greatest blessing. But he who fails twice probably deserves to fail, because he has learned nothing, and is incapable of learning anything from the lessons of his first failure. Let me say one word upon the present condition of this most delightful art in England. Remember that great masters in every art are rare. Perhaps one or two appear in a century. We ought not to expect more. It may even happen that those modern writers of our own, whom we have agreed to call great masters, will have to take lower rank among posterity, who will have great masters of their own. I am inclined, however, to think that a few of the nineteenth-century novelists will never be suffered to die, though they may be remembered principally for one book, that Thackeray will be remembered for his Vanity Fair, Dickens for David Copperfield, George Meredith for The Ordeal of Richard Feverell, George Eliot for Silas Marner, Giles Reed for The Cloister and the Hearse, and Blackmore for His Lorna Doon. On the other hand, without thinking or troubling ourselves at all about the verdict of posterity, which matters nothing to us compared with the verdict of our contemporaries, let us acknowledge that it is a bad year indeed when you have not produced some good work, work of a very high kind if not immortal work. An exhibition of the year's novels would generally show two or three at least, of which the country may be, say, reasonably proud. 
Does the Royal Academy of Art show every year more than two or three pictures, not immortal pictures, but pictures of which we may be reasonably proud? One would like, it is true, to see fewer bad novels published, as well as fewer bad pictures exhibited. The standard of the work, which is on the borderland between success and failure, should be higher. At the same time, I am very sure and certain that there never has been a time when better works of fiction have been produced, both by men and women. That art is not declining, but is advancing, which is cultivated on true, and not on false or conventional principles. Ought we not to be full of hope for the future, when such women as Mrs. Oliphant, and Mrs. Thackeray Ritchie write for us, when such men as Meredith, Blackmore, Black, Payne, Wilkie Collins, and Hardy, are still at their best, and such men as Lewis Stevenson, Christy Murray, Clark Russell, and Herman Merivale have just begun. I think the fiction, and indeed all the imaginary work of the future, will be far fuller in human interest than in the past. The old stories, no doubt they will still be the old stories, will be fitted to actors who up till recently were only used for the purposes of contrast. The drama of life which formerly was assigned to kings and princes will be played by figures taken as much from the great struggling unknown masses. Kings and great lords are chiefly picturesque and interesting on account of their beautiful costumes and the traditional belief in their power. Costume is certainly not a strong point in the lower ranks, but I think we shall not miss that, and wherever we go for our material, whether to the higher or the lower ranks, we may be sure of finding everywhere love, sacrifice, and devotion for virtues, with selfishness, cunning, and treachery for vices. Out of these, with their endless combinations and changes, that novelist must be poor indeed who cannot make a story. Lastly, I said at the outset that I would ask you to accord to novelists the recognition of their plays as artists, but after what has been said, I feel that to urge this further would be only a repetition of what has gone before. Therefore, though not all who write novels can reach the first or even the second rank, wherever you find good and faithful work, with truth, sympathy, and clearness of purpose, I pray you to give the author of that work the praise as that to an artist, an artist like the rest, the praise that you so readily accord to the earnest student of any other art. As for the great masters of the art, Fielding, Scott, Dickens, Thackeray, Victor Hugo, I, for one, feel irritated when the critics begin to appraise, compare, and to estimate them. There is nothing, I think, that we can give them but admiration, that is unspeakable, and gratitude, that is silent. This silence proves more eloquently than any words how great, how beautiful an art is that a fiction. End of Walter Beeson's Lecture Appendix I have been asked not to leave the young novelist at this point. Let me therefore venture upon a few words of advice. I do this without apology, because, like most men who write, I receive every week letters from young beginners asking for counsel and guidance. To all these I recommend the consideration of the rules I have laid down, and, above all, attention to truth, reality, and style. I was once asked to read a manuscript novel written by a young lady. The work was hurried, scammed, unreal. In fact, it had every fault. Yet there was something in it which made me think that there was hope for her. I therefore wrote to her, pointing out the faults without sparing her. I added that if she was not discouraged, but would begin again, and would prepare carefully the scenario of a novel, fitted with characters duly sought out, I would give her such further advice as was in my power. The very next day she sent me five scenarios. I have not heard from her since, and I hope she has renounced the art whose very elements she could not understand. Let me suppose, then, that the writer has got his novel completed. 
here begins the trouble as americans say and at this point my advice may be of use remember that all publishers are eager to get good work they are prepared to consider manuscripts carefully most of them pay men on whose judgment they rely men of literary standing to read and taste for them therefore it is a simple and obvious piece of advice that the writer should send his work to some good publisher and it is perfectly certain that if the work is good it will be accepted and published there is as i have said in the lecture little or no risk even with an unknown author over a really good novel but then the first work almost always contains immaturities and errors which prevent it from being really good more often than not it is on the borderline not so good as to make its publication desirable by a firm which will only issue good work or by any means safe to pay its expenses what then i would advise the author never from any considerations of vanity or self-confidence to pay money to a publisher for bringing out his book there are certain publishing houses not the best which bring out yearly quantities of novels nearly every one of which is paid for by the author because they are not good enough to pay their own expenses do not i would say swell the ranks of those who give the enemy reason to blaspheme this art refuse absolutely to publish on such ignominious terms remember that to be asked for money to pay for the expense of publication is to be told that your work is not good enough to be published if you have tried the half dozen best publishers and been refused by all realize that a work will not do then if you can get the advice of some experienced man of letters upon it and ponder over his judgment if you cannot reconsider the whole story from the beginning with a special reference to the rules which are here laid down if necessary rewrite the whole or if necessary put the whole into the fire and without being disheartened begin again with another and a better story do not aim at producing an absolutely new plot you cannot do it but persevere if you feel that the root of the matter is in you till your work is accepted and never 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 pay for publishing a novel let me end with a little piece of personal history there was a young man of four or five and twenty who ardently desired before all things to become a novelist he spent a couple of years giving to the work all his unemployed hours over a novel of modern life he took immense pains with it he wrote some of the scenes half a dozen times and spared neither labour nor thought to make it as good as he could make it when he really felt that he could do nothing more with it he rolled it up and sent it to a friend with a request that he would place it anonymously in mr macmillan's hand mr macmillan had it carefully read and sent the author still through the friend his reader's opinion the reader did not sign his opinion but he was a cambridge man a critic of judgment a man of taste a kindly man and he had once been if he was not still a mathematician these things were clearly evident from his handwriting as well as from the wording of his verdict this was to the effect that a novel should not be published for certain reasons which he proceeded to give but he laid down his objections with very great consideration for the writer indicating for his encouragement what he considered point of promise suggesting certain practical rules of construction which had been violated and showing where ignorance of the art and inexperience of life had caused faults such as to make it most undesirable for the author as well as impossible for a publisher of standing to produce the work the writer after the first pangs of disappointment plucked up heart and began to ponder over the lessons contained in that opinion the young man has since become a novelist of a sort and he takes this opportunity of returning his most sincere thanks to mr macmillan for his kindness in considering and refusing to publish an immature novel and to his anonymous critic for his invaluable letter 
would that all publishers, readers, were like unto that reader, as conscientious and as kindly, and as anxious to save beginners from putting forth bad work. End of the Appendix End of Section 2